Welcome back. Well, we've covered the preamble, uh, how the Constitution was ordained and established, Articles 1, 2, and 3, the legislative, executive, and judicial powers, Article 4, federalism, uh, the relationship among the states horizontally, and the related um, uh, powers of Congress to sort of monitor uh, states for uh, basic compliance with um, foundational principles of Republican government, and uh, the related power of Congress to to regulate the territories in such a way as to eventually um, make them into proper Republican states that will be admitted um, as new states on uh, equal footing with the old. We've talked about Article 5, uh, the um, provision of the Constitution setting forth how it's to be amended. And you might say, okay, well, what's left? We've kind of covered everything. Not quite. Articles 6 and 7, both of which are quite short, uh, remain to be discussed. Article 6 is going to be an elaboration of the supremacy of the Constitution, its status as supreme law of the land. And Article 7 is going to give us a little more specificity about how this ordainment and establishment process is actually uh, going to work. What, what do you mean, we, the people of the United States, do ordain and establish this Constitution? You know, who's the people? How, how do we cash that out um, concretely? You know, how united are the states going to be c coming into this thing? How, how's all that going to work? So first, Article 6. Article 6 um, is uh, a provision of the Constitution uh, conventionally um, referred to just as a shorthand, the Supremacy Clause of the Constitution. It establishes that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, notwithstanding anything uh, in uh, any state constitution or state law um, it's supreme over federal statutes, it's supreme over federal treaties, it's supreme over all forms of, of state law, state constitutional law, state statutory law, judge-made law, and in fact judges both of um, the federal government and of the states are oath-bound to treat the Constitution as supreme law of the land, as are other officials, state and federal, the president, the, 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 the Congress, uh, cabinet officers, um, state uh, 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 executive and, and legislative officers. So this is the supreme law of the land that every official, really, state and federal, is oath-bound to recognize as such. Now, a few things about that. One, the Articles of the Confederation said nothing of the sort. They never described themselves as law, uh, much less supreme law much less supreme law that state judges had to respect even over state constitutions. Um, and in fact, they, the articles didn't even say that anything, that the things that Congress did were law, it didn't describe the old Congress as a legislature. Did use the words law and legislature, but only referring to state laws and state legislatures. And so state courts under the Articles of Confederation really treated the articles as um, uh, basically no more than a treaty. And the rule of treaties um, was that they could be superseded by later statutes. And so state courts sometimes basically tr allowed state statutes to pretty much, that were passed after the Articles to, in effect, um, deviate from the Articles. Um, but the Constitution says none of that anymore. The Constitution is supreme law, and it's supreme over all forms of state law. And state judges, among others, are oath-bound to treat it as such. Uh, and the point here is not just that the Constitution says this. You know, anyone can just say it. But um, today in America, everyone respects that. People actually don't go around saying, well, an ordinary statute can repeal the Constitution, or judges can make stuff up openly. Can, actually, judges can openly proclaim that the real supreme law is what they say rather than what the Constitution says. You might think judges have misconstrued the Constitution, but they all purport to be applying the written constitution, as do state officials. Um, and, and, and so sociologically, as well as formally, the constitution really is the supreme law of our land that, that, that people take oaths to and, and, as a general proposition, take quite seriously, both ordinary citizens and government officials. Now the question is, why is it the supreme law then? OK, it says so professor, and okay, everyone seems to accept that today. It wasn't quite true in the 1860s with the Civil War, but today they seem to accept, uh, accept this. Well, why? Why should it be the supreme law of the land? Why should stuff that happened 200 years ago be more important than the statute adopted tomorrow by the House and the Senate and signed by the President? Isn't that, that statute 
today in the here and adopted today in the here and now, why shouldn't that be the supreme law of the land, trumping something that a bunch of old wet, white dead guys agreed to 200 years ago? And I think the answer is that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land because actually in, a, in, a, in, in some very real ways, it's got a deeper democratic foundation. It's higher because it's, it's deeper. It comes from the people themselves. Remember, at the time of the Constitution, people who, in fact, might not be eligible to vote for state legislatures, might not be eligible to vote for Congress, got to vote on the Constitution itself um, in a process that um, involved a whole year of ordinary people talking to each other about how they and their posterity would be governed, the sort that doesn't happen when ordinary laws are, are being passed, the latest tariff bill or tweak of the antitrust laws or, um, or budget or, or, or what have you. So the Constitution is the supreme law of land because it comes from the people. It's higher law because it has a more democratic foundation. And amendments trump ordinary statutes because it was much harder to adopt them. They, a much broader democratic consensus. That's Article 5. Two-thirds of the House have to agree on a, statu on a, on a, on a constitutional amendment. Two-thirds of the Senate. And then three-quarters of the states. So if it's hard to get an amendment adopted, two-thirds, two-thirds, three-quarters, it should be equally hard to repeal that. It should take another two-thirds, two-thirds, three-quarters to undo what that special two-thirds, two-thirds, three-quarters have done. So. Um, uh, amendments should trump ordinary statutes because an ordinary statute just needs you know, half of the House, half of the Senate, and, 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 and the President, and the states don't even weigh in. So an ordinary statute doesn't have the same democratic pedigree as the Constitution itself or its amendments. Now, once you understand that basically the Supremacy Clause has kind of um, a democratic gradient to it, you can see why the Constitution and um, Trump's a statute, so only statutes, congressional statutes passed in pursuance of, consistent with the Constitution, are the supreme law. You can understand why it should trump an ordinary treaty. A treaty shouldn't be able to change the Constitution. Two-thirds of the Senate, you know, with the President on their side, shouldn't be able to modify what two-thirds of the House, two-thirds of the Senate, um, and three-quarters of the states have agreed to. Um, so the Constitution should trump a statute, should trump a treaty, should trump state constitutions, because only, that's only involving one state rather than we the people of the United States as a whole, should trump a, a state statute, a fortiori, that's a, a Latin phrase meaning even more strongly, if the U.S. Constitution says it's the supreme level and notwithstanding anything to the contrary in a state constitution, well, I, it also goes on to say notwithstanding anything to the contrary in a state statute for um, um, the same basic reasons, a fortiori, a state statute is lower than a state constitution. Um, so um, when some people sometimes ask me, well, wasn't se didn't the se secessionists have a leg to stand on in the 1860s? Where's the Constitution prohibit secession? I say, like, what part of the Supremacy Clause do you not understand? I, ha I have kids, sometimes I look at them and I say, what part of no did you not understand here? So the Supremacy Clause says the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, notwithstanding anything that a state does. So once you're in, you're in, and the Supremacy Clause makes that clear. Um, and um, uh, it, uh, it's going to turn out, Article 7, that you don't have to join the thing. Um, that Article 7 is going to explain that if you don't vote for the Constitution you're in, uh, in New York, you're not bound by it in New York. Or if you don't vote for the Constitution, in, if Rhode Island doesn't say yes, Rhode Island's not going to be bound by it. But once Rhode Island says yes, once you're in, you're in. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to Article 7. Um, one more feature of Article 6 that I wanted to highlight um, for you um, is, um, okay, the Constitution is the highest law because it's most democratic along with its amendments. Then come federal statutes that are in conformity with the Constitution because um, uh, they're passed by a continental body, n not quite as democratically um, participatory as the amendment process, as the ordainment and establishment process, but next best. L l later on, our, um, the, con the, uh, the Supremacy Clause says state constitutions and state statutes are, are later. But it also talks about federal treaties. And, and treaties are below the Constitution and they're above state constitutions because treaties involve all of the United States. But what's the relationship between federal treaties and st federal statutes? Now, courts have basically said treaties and statutes are both below the U.S. Constitution and above state constitutions and state law, but they're on the same level. So basically, we, uh, uh, the courts have said 
the last in time rule applies. If you've got two statutes and they conflict, which statute do you go with? The more recent one, because they're on the same level, and if they're on the same level, you go with the more recent one. But if something's on a higher level, it trumps even if it's older. The Constitution, even if we're talking about a 14th Amendment adopted 150 years ago, it trumps a statute tomorrow that's inconsistent with it, because it's on a higher level. But as between one constitutional amendment and another constitutional amendment, it's the later amendment that governs, so we repeal prohibition. Um, as between two statutes, because they're on the same level, it's the later statute that trumps. As between two treaties, it's the later treaty that prevails. And so the argument courts have adopted is, well, treaties and statutes are pretty much on the same level, so statutes can repeal treaties and treaties can repeal statutes, whichever is more recent. But I think if you look carefully at the Constitution, it says the Constitution, statutes, and treaties in that order, statutes are higher than treaties, and they're higher than treaties. They come, they're mentioned first because they're more democratically accountable, because you have the House of Representatives involved. Um, and so, um, although this is not what courts have um, said, it closely tracks what courts in general have, in fact, done, um, uh, which is understand that there are certain things that actually treaties can't do. Here are some things that you shouldn't be allowed to do by a mere treaty shouldn't be allowed to um, raise an army by a mere treaty. Only the, the House of Representatives needs to be, I think, involved in that. And that's why the army lapses every two years, and that's tied to elections for the House of Representatives every two years. Um, an ordinary treaty shouldn't be uh, allowed to create a f new federal crime. Only Congress should be allowed, uh, the House of Representatives, to create a new crime, or to raise an internal tax, or to declare um, a, 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 a war. Um, there are certain things structurally that you need the House of Representatives to be involved in, and I think the same is true. If you're going to repeal a statute, a statute that was adopted um, with the House of Representatives' participation, you shouldn't be allowed to do that by a mere treaty. A treaty can say, we promise we will repeal some pre-existing statute, but then Congress needs to repeal that statute and the House of Representatives needs to get involved. In technical law talk, certain sorts of treaties cannot be self-executing. They require subsequent congressional legislation. So, for example, when um, uh, Thomas Jefferson tells um, um, Napoleon, we're going to buy Louisiana from you, and the Senate says, yes, we are, great, but who's going to pay for that? You need a, the House of Representatives to be involved in a bill that spends a dime or raises an internal tax or creates a new federal crime or raises an army or declares a war. And I think symmetrically, by, by sort of similar structural logic, the, the House of Representatives needs to be involved if a, if a, a statute is to be, a federal statute is to be um, uh, repealed. So treaties should trump state statutes and state constitutions because treaties represent the United States, but treaties aren't really at the same level as statutes. So I say the Constitution, laws, and treaties in that order for democratic reasons. And by the way, that's the order in the Supremacy Clause itself, if you look at it carefully. Okay, so the supreme law of the land, and it's the law of the land, the entirety of the United States, including its territories, including any state. Once a state is in, it's in, it's part of the land. If you don't like it, you're always free to leave, but you don't get to take the land with you, the water with you. All Americans basically fought to defend um, Charleston Harbor in the War of 1812, and so the people in Charleston don't unilaterally ever get to turn those guns around and point them into the bellies of their fellow Americans. All Americans fought for New Orleans in uh, the War of 1812, the kind of Revolutionary War Parts II. Um, since all, the entire continent basically helps defend that for good geostrategic and national security reasons, the people in New Orleans shouldn't be allowed just unilaterally to turn those um, uh, guns the other way. Andy Jackson uh, understood that. He's, he stared down those South Carolinians when he was president. He was born in South Carolina, uh, but he stared them down. Um, he understands the importance of New Orleans. He's the, the victor of the Battle of New Orleans. And so for very sound geostrategic reasons, the Constitution says we, this is the supreme law of the land, notwithstanding anything in any state constitution any state law. A state on its own can't take itself out of the Union. The Supremacy Clause is pretty emphatic about that. So listen up, Rick Perry. Um, and as we talked about in our first lectures, 
people adopting the Constitution in the preamble knew that. No Federalist ever said, gee, why don't you vote for the thing, and if you don't like it, you can always leave. Instead, the Federalists insist that they're creating a more perfect union for geostrategic reasons, and that takes us to Article 7. Because Article 7 is going to cash out the preamble. The preamble talks about we, the people of the United States, ordaining and establishing this Constitution. Article 7 talks about how this Constitution, same words, are, is to be or, you know, established. Same, same um, word as the preamble. Uh, preamble is the first sentence of the Constitution. Article 7 is the last sentence uh, of the original Constitution. So one sentence to begin, one sentence to end. They're kind of matching bookends, sort of if it's a building, sort of the front porch and the rear portico. They, they perfectly match. Again, a sentence of peace. And Article 7 tells us how we, the people of the United States, are actually going to do this. So first, what do you mean people? Article 7 says here's what we mean by people. Special conventions are going to be the ones deciding. Um, whether to ratify or not. Not ordinary legislatures, but special conventions. It doesn't spell out all the rules about how these conventions are to be um, selected, but the idea is they should really be representative of the people in a very special way. Um, and then um, in the different states, rules emerge to, to sort of implement that idea that these are supposed to be conventions of the people. And you might say, well, why not just have a referendum? And I think the simplest answer is, because the referendum really hadn't been invented yet. The Swiss hadn't done it um, yet on a, on a kind of national level. And, and, and so the idea of, of voting for individuals, for representatives, was well established, but not quite the idea of voting on ordinary laws. The, California doesn't exist yet, and, and so we don't have the California style, the Western style referendum. That's going to be a later part of our story. And part of the reason it doesn't exist is because the idea is, when you're voting for laws, you actually have to discuss them and deliberate among them. You can't just vote. You have to sort of talk first. And, and how is that going to happen on a state level? Maybe it could happen in New England because you have town meetings. And in New England, people go actually in individual towns, and they talk about something once. There's some proposal, and then they meet again a second time and a third time, and only after everyone's talked about it do they vote on the proposal. But the South doesn't have actually townships that way. It doesn't have a structure for people to meet face to face and talk amongst themselves and say, well, what's this provision of Article 4 mean? And what do you mean citizen? And why isn't there a Bill of Rights? You couldn't have easily done that, actually, in Virginia, town by town, because it doesn't have a township structure. So you had special ratifying conventions were as democratic as you were going to get in 1787, as democratic as was reasonably possible. It does mean that there was some malapportionment in, in some of the, the, the states. The Federalists didn't always benefit from the malapportionment. I think it may have helped them in South Carolina. It might have hurt them in Massachusetts. But in, in any event, they didn't basically make all the, 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 uh, the ground rules that, that pre-existed them. They had to kind of work with, with the legal structures that they inherited. And the legal structures that they inherited, um, basically, they tried to tweak by saying, let's have special conventions elected in the most democratic way imaginable, um, given um, the rules of our society. And I think the, the ratification really um, did cash out that um, idea of the people. So the phrase the people in the preamble is echoed in, in Article 7 by the phrase conventions, these special bodies, specially selected. Um, so not just the ordinary lawmakers, this, um, but people with a special mandate. You know, you vote for a legislature and you think they're gonna, it's going to be about how to, how to um, uh, um, put the surplus in a lockbox, um, and it turns out that the issues that really confront that Congress are going to be how to deal with 9-11. So when the legislature, you vote for them for uh, two years, and they're going to just decide all sorts of stuff that may come up. These conventions, a special election on one issue that you know about. You've been given the Constitution as a voter. You can, you can read it and then vote for people who promise they're going to be basically supportive in this convention or they're going to be skeptical. But you're going to want them to go and, and talk and listen and, um, and then vote only after they've heard all the arguments all the way around, because you can't do that yourself. So you vote for people that you think are going to sort of represent your instincts on this proposal that you have in front of you before you vote for them. So that's the idea of conventions of the people at the founding. But Article 7 does one other really interesting thing. It says the Constitution will go into effect among whatever nine states say yes. Thirteen don't have to say yes. What do you mean? We talked about what do you mean by the people now? What do you mean by the United States? And, and Article 7 says 
The United States basically means any nine. Nine is required. If less than nine say yes, we're stuck with the Articles of Confederation. But if nine say yes, the Constitution will go into effect among the states so ratifying. Okay? So why that rule? Because the states are sovereign. Because if Rhode Island says no, it doesn't matter if the other 12 states have said yes. Rhode Island gets to decide for itself. It's sovereign under the Articles Confederation. It's retained its sovereignty. So Rhode Island will only be in if she says yes. No state can bind any other. Um, but how is it that only nine are required? The Articles Confederation professor said 13. Ah, yes it did, but it also said everyone is going to abide by the Articles Confederation, and the states aren't abiding by the Articles Confederation. Rhode Island, for example, has promised to pay um, into the federal coffers and do other things, and it's not doing that. All the states promise to basically f follow the Articles, and they're not. And so precisely because each state is sovereign, um, if the treaty, which is all the Articles of Confederation really is, isn't really being implemented properly, the states can basically disregard it and supersede it under the, the last-in-time rule. They agreed to this treaty, but it's not working, and so they can um, choose a different system. That's the legal argument for why they are allowed to disregard the Articles. Thirteen is unworkable. Rhode Island's never going to say yes, so either we're going to go down with this ship or... Instead, we're going to come up with a plan, and at least nine of us, if we can agree amongst ourselves, are going to create a new, more perfect union. Um, and no one's bound, absent their consent, but once you're in, you're in. And this new thing is not going to be a mere treaty. It's not going to be Articles of Confederation, a league. It's not going to be a thing with each state is sovereign. We're going to create a perfect union, indivisible, on the model of Scotland and England. Once you're in, you're in. You don't have to join. And that's what this picture is all about. George Washington is elected president, and only 11 states are in this new union. North Carolina hasn't said yes yet. Rhode Island hasn't said yes yet, but, the, but 11 states have said yes, and they're going to um, go into this thing, um, this new United States, on their own. No state is bound absent its consent, but once you're in, you're in, and Article 5 is going to say, gee, for future amendments, even if your state votes against an amendment, if three-quarters of the other states vote yes, you're bound by that. So once you're in, you're in. Article 5 is different than Article 7. The, nine don't, the 11 don't bind the 2. The 9 wouldn't bind the 4 if 9 said yes and 4 said no. But Article 5 is going to say, once you do vote for the Constitution, you're bound by it. Um, now, Constitution, we've come to the end of the original Constitution. This rear portico of the original document, which sort of balancing the preamble. It was originally supposed to be the end of the document. It turns out it's not the end of the document because we've added a bunch of of amendments to the thing. Um, and that's what we're going to start talking about now, the amendments to the Constitution. So um, the amendments get tacked on to the end of the Constitution. So what began as this kind of rear porch, rear portico of the original Constitution has now become kind of a passageway to the amendments. So that's what we're going to talk about for the, the rest of this segment of the course. So stay tuned. <laughs>